Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Today we are going to talk about diffusion. Um, why is it modeled as a second derivative? Okay, so, uh, and then uh, uh, some boundary conditions after that, if we get to them. Okay, so diffusion is this spreading out of a concentration molecules due to random motion, right? So everyone's familiar, you drop, you drop some dye in, uh, hello? Okay, so you drop some dye into a fluid and then over time the dye spreads out and becomes sort of equalized. And if it's red dye in water, then it starts out like really concentrated red dye. And at the end, it's like dilute pink dye everywhere, right? So, uh, you know, dye, as the example, dye spreads from high concentration to low. And this is like analogous for heat flow where heat flows from hot to cold. Uh, you know, uh, if you've had transport, heat flows from hot to cold because of like jiggling of molecules, right? So, and this is the same reason. So it happens for same reason. Random molecular motion. And the fact that it's random is important. So it's not like diffusion is happening because the molecules are flowing in bulk in a direction. Uh, that would be flow instead of diffusion, right? It's a, it's, it's a random jiggling and they spread out in a way that doesn't look like a velocity. Okay, but we'll get to that, we'll get to that, okay. So to model the, the kind of spatial modeling, which includes diffusion, we have to consider a control volume. So imagine that you have a cell or an embryo or something that's like, you know, a container. And in that container, you have some sort of spatial gradient of something. In this case, the spatial gradient is, is this green color. Uh, it could be a concentration of a molecule, et cetera, right? And so what you want to do is you want to pick out a control volume. Okay, so um, how big, question, how big is the control volume? How big is the control volume in, in real life? Now it's possible that the, you know, when we write down our differential equation models, uh, what we're gonna end up with is an infinitesimally small control volume. But in real life, it's not, you know, what you're really modeling is maybe the cytoplasm inside a cell. Uh, and that is a control volume that you're gonna pretend is well mixed. So there's no spatial gradients within the cell maybe, um, or maybe there are spatial gradients in the cell and your control volume is smaller than the cell. Um, so you want to have your control volume be the right size, right? So if it's too big, if it's too big, and too big is a relative term, right? So it depends on your dynamical system, um, but I'm gonna leave that vague for now. If it's too big, then you have too much spatial variation. Within your control volume. So if I made the control volume as big as this ellipse here, then it's not a very good control volume because I have spatial, clear spatial gradients within my control volume. So you want your control volume to be small enough that you can approximate the concentration in that volume to be constant everywhere, okay? But if it's too small, this is where we run into the, you know, uh, we're actually gonna make it infinitesimally small to model things uh, with differential equations. Um, but if it's too small, then molecules are not continuous. Right, so you get down to the molecular level and you don't have a continuum approximation anymore where you know, usually you, can, you consider concentration to be this continuous variable. Uh, but when you get down to the molecular level, then you have to worry about stochastic events where inside your control volume, you either have five, six or seven molecules. And that's not continuous, right? It's, it's discrete, it's quantized. Okay, uh, but we're gonna pretend like it's okay and that we can take the control volume as small as we want it. And we're going to use the continuum approximation. Okay, so think about molecules uh, of species I going in and out of this control volume here, right? And you have some sort of uh, flux, J of X, and uh, coming in the left-hand side, and you also have J of X plus delta X coming out the right-hand side. So uh, the right-hand side is at, at, at the coordinate of X plus delta X, okay? 
And this is a flux, right? So this J is a flux, which means it is in units of moles, or if you want to get down to molecular molecules, but let's go ahead and keep moles, moles per area time. Now in this sort of thought experiment that we're doing here, when we're going to derive this differential equation uh, for diffusion, we're going to assume that we have 1D movement. We're not going to worry about multiple dimensions. Uh, a lot of biological uh, processes can be approximated down to one dimension, maybe two, maybe two. Um, 1D movement here in this assumption, or in, in this uh, derivation, we're going to have zero bulk velocity, which means the only reason why things are moving around is because of the random motion of the molecules. And also, we're going to, for the now, we're going to assume no reaction terms. So this molecule is not binding to anything. It's not being converted into anything. It's not being destroyed. It's not being synthesized. It's just diffusing around. Okay, we are also going to consider the fact that this box that we're looking at uh, is, has an area, right? So there's an area of each side of this box, right? So this is an area A. And that's actually, uh, you know, the area that we're, we're talking about typically with a flux here. Um, so the volume of this box is A times delta X. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a material balance on species I. So we're tracking what's, what's coming into the box, what's going out of the box, right? So our partial of the moles N at X with respect to time is equal to the area times the flux. The flux coming in from the left-hand side is J of X, and the flux going out the right-hand side is J of X plus delta X. Or we can flip it around as is typically done. So J of X plus delta X is written first. So now we have a minus sign pulled out in front of the area. Now don't be fooled by the fact that I drew the arrows going in and out of the box, although you can't see the one on the left anymore because I like, colored it in orange. Um, but the arrows look like the flux is going from left to right in both cases. That's not necessarily true. Um, if the flux is positive, it's going from left to right. If it's negative, it's going from right to left. So it's possible that one of these is, has a negative term, which means it's going in the other direction. No big deal. That's just what it is. Okay. Um, now let's work with this partial derivative with respect to N, uh, number of molecules or moles or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's equal to the partial with respect to time of N can be changed into the concentration as a function of X times the volume, but I already said the volume is delta X times the area A. Okay, and I'm going to divide by, uh, by A times delta X, right? So divide by that. And what you get in the end then, as I divide both sides of the equation by delta X times A, you get DC DT on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you get minus one over X, or sorry, one over delta X times J of X plus delta X minus J of X. And this is for our control volume that has this finite size delta X. But we don't really care about the finite size control volume box. We want it to be in the limit in which delta X goes to zero. And so if we take that limit as delta X goes to zero, the right-hand side ends up just being negative of the partial of our flux with respect to X. Okay, so this is just, uh, we didn't make really any assumptions here. I mean, we defined our system where there's like no flow and no reactions or whatever, but we're not making any like leaps of faith about like pretend that the molecule is a sphere or whatever, right? Um, so this is actually, it's a pretty solid uh, equation and it just comes from a material balance. That's all we got here, right? So our concentration, the way it changes is equal to the negative of the spatial derivative of our flux, okay? Uh, 
that's not like super intuitive, but it's an equation that you have to get used to. It pops up all the time. Okay, but we don't care about flux. What we care about is we want the right hand side to be in a, a variable that we care about, which is concentration. Right. So how can I change the net flux? Um, sorry, how can I change the flux there uh, into a concentration? So the first, so the, we're, the way we're going to do that is we're going to now consider instead of one control volume, we're going to consider two control volumes next to each other. Okay, and so instead of uh, flow flux going in and out to different sides of the control volume, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at uh, the the net flux here. So we still have the same idea where we have an area. And what we care about is which molecules are flowing across that boundary, across that area A. Let's so you have an area A here. And we care about is the, the, the molecules moving across that boundary. Now, I was talking in fluxes before, but just for a moment, let's pretend like we can write down a quantity, which is the molar flow rate. It's not really a flow, like I said, um, but it is, uh, you know, it can be written down like one. And here, uh, what I'm going to define is I'm going to define the center of the control volume on the left to be at the coordinate x0, x0, and the control, center of the control volume on the right is x0 plus delta x, where each one of these uh, boxes is delta x wide. Okay, so the molar flow rate is is evaluated at x naught from the left hand side and the molar flow rate uh, from the right hand side is evaluated at x naught plus delta x okay and that's that guy going back the other way so in this case in this case i really am specifically talking about molecules so the molar flow rate at x naught is the molecules moving from left to right across that boundary and the molar flow rate at x naught plus delta x are the molecules moving from the right boundary to the left, sorry, from the right box to the left box across the boundary. Okay, um, this molar flow rate is not a flux because this is in moles per time. Right, and this one in particular that I just drew here at, at x naught plus delta x, this is the, these are the molecules hitting boundary. from the right-hand side, from the right box. And then the other one is from the left side. Okay. Now, if I write down, so what is this molar flow rate? Uh, this n dot, and I'm just gonna say of x, just because it's general here, is equal to the concentration of x times the area of the boundary times some velocity v. Now this velocity v, it's, it makes me uncomfortable. It's a little tricky. It, it, remember I said there's no bulk flow here. So we don't actually have a velocity. This would be like the velocity, maybe some average velocity of the, of the molecules, but even that's not right because if there was an average velocity of all the molecules and it was something positive and then everything would be flowing and that's not what we have, right? So this v, I'm, I'm intentionally leaving it vague, but it has something to do with like, you know, if I could look at every single molecule and each one has a velocity and, it, and you know, some of them hit the boundary with some speed, some of them hit the boundary with some other speed. Uh, and together in some aggregate, they're kind of going across the boundary. And then you have molecules from the other side going across the boundary in the opposite direction. Okay, um, so the next thing we can write down is what is the net, the net molar flow? And that would be the molar flow at x naught minus the molar flow at x naught plus delta x. And if I substitute in what I wrote below in blue in the bottom of the screen currently, then this net molar flow is the area of the boundary times this make me uncomfortable feel velocity times the concentration at x naught minus the concentration at x naught plus delta x, right? So each one of these concentrations is the, the, the bulk or average concentration in the two boxes. 
Now that's a little bit cheating because these boxes are supposed to be small. And at some point, uh, well, if the boxes were too big, then you would have spatial variation within the box, uh, appreciable spatial variation in the box. And so what concentration is this actually? It's some sort of average concentration. You could take like the integral and divide by the delta x and you get some average concentration. Um, uh, but here I'm just representing the average concentration by the concentration at x naught. I'll show you why that's cheating in just a second. Okay, um, it's not really cheating. Don't don't be mad. This derivation is is is, is pretty solid. Okay, so um, but we don't care about net molar flow because we don't want our equation to depend on how big our boundary is. So I'm going to divide area to the other side, and that will recover us back with flux, right? So our flux then, if I divide both sides by the area, our flux at uh, our net flux at x naught is equal to or I guess I should say across the boundary, but let's just say it's at x naught for now, um, is equal to the negative of the velocity because I divided the area out times this concentration difference where I, I pulled the negative out so I can get, make x plus delta x the first term inside the parentheses. And this is the net flux now. Okay, so now we have net flux kind of in concentrations, but we have this, we're still working with control volumes here. We still have a delta X we have to worry about. We still have this vague velocity that is not really what we want it to be, okay? Now, like I said, the velocity can't be the same for every molecule because it's not a bulk velocity. We're assuming that's zero. So instead, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to exchange this, this, um, par this uh, parameter V, this velocity, uh, which makes me feel uncomfortable again. Uh, for something else that also makes me feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to call this delta X over delta T. And what is this delta T? This delta T is the uh, time scale for molecules to move a distance of delta X. That's not really any better than writing in velocity because this delta T kind of is uh, delta X over V, right? Uh, but right, it, it, so it, it points out that we're, that we're working with, what we're working with here is a time scale. It's not an actual true delta T. It's not measurable. It's not um, in the same way that you might think uh, where, and it's not the same for every molecule. It can't be, right? Now, one thing about this time scale is that it must depend on delta X because the molecules in my fluid, they don't care where I've drawn the control volume, right? The control volume is just something that I made up. And so I can draw, draw a big control volume and the time scale for molecules to move that big delta X will be longer than if I draw a small control volume, in which case the time scale to move that small delta X will be shorter. So delta T has to depend on delta X, but it can't depend on it linearly. Like I said, it, it just it can't be like delta t is equal to delta x over velocity, because if it if it were a linear relationship between delta t and delta x, then you have a bulk of velocity, and, and we don't want that, right? Okay, so there's there's some non-linear dependence of delta t on delta x, but we're we're leaving that ill-defined for now. We're also assuming, and of course we're assuming this, we're assuming that delta x is small, and the reason why that's important is because we need the concentration, uh, at least in our local neighborhood, we need our concentration variation to be a line. Um, remember uh, a couple lectures ago, I wrote down like, what is the concentration of my morphogen as a function of X? And it looked like this exponential gradient, right? That's a curve. We don't want it to be a curve. We want it to be a straight line. And if, if Delta X is small enough, then if I draw my concentration, as a function of X, then it's a line. It's a straight line.
Okay, so now you see maybe uh, where I was going with this a few minutes ago, where I was saying um, my concentration at X naught, which would be right here, my concentration at X naught, that's not really the concentration in the box because the concentration varies within the box, but it varies linearly. And so my concentration at X naught in the center of the box is equal to the average concentration over the whole box because it's a line. If it weren't a line, if it were a curve, then that wouldn't be true. They, they wouldn't be, the average concentration wouldn't be the same as the concentration in the very center, but it is because it's a line. Okay, um, and you can derive that. Uh, okay, so there's my concentration at X naught. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and fill in the concentration at X naught plus delta X in just a second. Uh, but I wanna do this first. So this, we're assuming that delta X is small so that um, concentration is just a line. And what that means is, so any curve, if you zoom in close enough, any continuous well-behaved well curve becomes a line if you zoom in close enough, right? And that's because of a Taylor series expansion. So if I take my concentration as a function of X and I Taylor series expand it about X naught, I get C of X naught plus DC DX evaluated at X naught times X minus X naught plus one half D squared C DX squared evaluated at X naught times, oh, I, I didn't say this, I forgot. Um, this X minus X naught, that's my delta X. Okay, so then I'm just gonna put delta X quantity squared here in the second term. Okay, so <clears throat> we're assuming that delta X is small enough that when we do a Taylor series expansion, we can ignore the, this third term and then higher terms after that. And this, this will hold true for any curve that is well-behaved, continuous, continuously differentiable, at least up to the second order, and the gradient isn't equal to zero. So it's not flat, it's not a flat line. Um, and in that case, we can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Finally, we get to a point where it just looks like a line. Okay, uh, the Taylor series third order term or second order term and higher it becomes zero or negligible. Okay, so what this means, all right, so I know this is taking a long time to, to get to where we want, but we got to lay the foundation. Okay, so um, continuing here with the Taylor series expansion, um, I just defined here for you what delta X is in this case, right? So delta X is equal to X minus X naught. Or another way to say that is that X is equal to X naught plus delta X. And that's what we care about. Um, so we're gonna put this in for C of X. Okay, that was a little bit of an excursion. I don't know how much uh, the undergraduate students in here has seen Taylor series, um, at least applied to like important engineering problems. Uh, but uh, that's why I wrote in red, this is like maybe like more of the, of the grad material, uh, the Taylor series part. Okay, so because uh, I now have a, um, a nice relationship between my C at X naught and my C at X naught plus delta X. Where so my C at X naught plus delta X equals to my C at X naught plus delta X times my derivative. We can see this graphically, right? So now we can go back up to this graph up here. And if I have my delta X here, let me, let me draw it um, in position from X naught plus delta X, right? So here's my concentration at X naught plus delta X. The distance here is delta X and the Y distance is delta C. And this means, and then you, of course you have the slope of the line, right? Which is your derivative. So this means that C at X naught plus delta X is approximately equal to C at X naught plus delta C equals to C at X naught plus DC DX at X naught times delta X, right? So that's where, we, that's where we got. Now you can see that graphically because it's just a line but that comes from the fact that we have a Taylor series expansion where we've ignored second order terms and higher. Okay, so we have this nice relationship for C at X naught plus delta X. That's what we wanna do. We wanna start getting rid of these delta Xs. So finally, I'm gonna take this uh, relationship that I just derived here 
because we have a Taylor series expansion of only two terms. And I'm going to plug that into here. So that's where we're going with that. Okay. So finally, this is not finally. The next step is j at x naught is equal to the negative. For velocity, I'm going to put delta x over delta t, like I said. And inside here, I'm going to substitute the Taylor series expansion we just made. And that will be c at x naught plus the c dx evaluated at x naught times delta x minus, and you still have this minus c at x naught term at the end. Okay, so you can see that the c of x naught terms cancel out. And finally, what I get for my flux here at x naught, that's equal to the negative of delta x quantity squared over delta t times dc dx evaluated at x naught. Okay, cool, except for we still have these delta x and delta t terms to deal with. So, so what do we do with them? First, we're going to acknowledge the fact that our flux does not and cannot, does not depend on delta x. Our flux can't depend on delta x because our flux is something that's real. It's something that's real and true at a particular point in space. And the flux doesn't care how big or small we make delta x. The flux doesn't have any idea about our control volumes. It's just happening in real life. So the flux can't depend on delta x. Delta x is arbitrary to the flux. In the same way, this slope here of the concentration gradient here, this slope of this curve also can't, it doesn't care about delta x. It, it does not know anything about our control volumes. This also does not depend on delta x. It's the slope at x naught. Okay, so if I have these two things, the left-hand side doesn't depend on delta x, and one of the two factors on the right-hand side doesn't depend on x, delta x, that means that this conglomeration of deltas things, the first factor on the right-hand side, also cannot depend on delta x. They just can't. That has to be constant, that grouping there has to be constant with respect to delta x. So what we get here in the end is that this grouping delta x quantity squared over delta t is going to be called something called the diffusion coefficient or diffusivity, uh, which is typically written as the capital D. And that capital D, this diffusion coefficient is constant with respect to delta x. It doesn't care what delta x is. Okay, and so what we get in the end is something called fixed law of diffusion or fixed first law, fixed law, which says that our flux at any point X is equal to minus this diffusion coefficient times DC DX evaluated it at X. I'm gonna erase that part. Okay, so, um, this is what's known as fixed first law of diffusion. So our flux is proportional to the gradient in concentration. Now I put this little um, parentheses with a dot in the middle after the D. I'm gonna drop that from now on, but before I do that, let me say this. So D could be, or is, so could be a function of concentration and identity of species i, the whole thing that we just did the der derivation for, the concentration and identity of a species i, the concentration and identity of other species in solution, or of the solvent itself. And it's definitely a function of temperature. Because 
the higher the temperature, the faster molecules are going to wiggle around. For now, as long as we're not changing the temperature, which usually we don't in this class, although we could, you could look at temperature effects. But for now, we're going to assume that temperature is constant and the diffusivity is just constant. So if we, you know, write down differential equations and I ask you to solve them, your diffusivity is constant. It might be two different diffusivities for two different molecules, but we're not going to let those diffusivities uh, change with concentration, for example. Right? They're constant with respect to concentration, constant with respect to location inside your cell, et cetera. Okay, so that's fixed law. Um, but diffusion also, um, I'd be remiss in, if I failed to write this. Uh, there's something called the Stokes Einstein relation uh, for how diffus diffusivity changes with respect to certain parameters. So, diffusivity, uh, according to this uh, theory, is equal to the Boltzmann constant times your temperature divided by six pi the viscosity times R. Okay, so let's write those, some of those things out. Uh, this is your Boltzmann constant. Of course, T is your temperature. I'm not gonna write that. Uh, mu is your viscosity. And R is your radius or effective radius of the molecule that you're talking about that's diffusing. Now we're rarely gonna use that, uh, but it's good to know uh, that these are the things that diffusivity most strongly depends on. Okay, so let's, so that's fixed first law where your flux is equal to the negative times the diffusivity of your gradient. If we back up, and write down our um, equation that we derive from the material balance, and I'll rewrite it here. Our concentration inside our control volume as a function of time is equal to negative times the flux, the gradient of the flux. So if I combine those two and put uh, the, great, the flux uh, fixed law inside there on the right-hand side, then I get another negative, a, diff a diffusivity and a dc dx. And if we're going to just assume diffu diffusivity is constant, then this just becomes the second derivative in space of the concentration on the right-hand side. This equation here is very famous. You have a partial with respect to time of the concentration on the left-hand side, a second partial with respect to space on the right-hand side. This is what's known as the diffusion equation. It describes a simple system in which the only thing that's happening is diffusion of the molecule. If you've taken differential equations or maybe partial differential equations, it might be here. Uh, this is also the same thing as the heat equation. It's the exact same thing, except for in there, you're were, you were looking at temperature instead of concentration. And instead of diffusivity, you have like thermal conductivity. Okay, so quick question. Uh, just to, to back up just a little bit, I threw out this term Boltzmann constant. Uh, I don't want to pose this question to you. I'm just going to say it. The Boltzmann constant is just equal to the ideal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. Okay, just the same thing. Uh, so when you're talking about thermodynamics on the molecular scale, you use the Boltzmann constant, and on the molar scale, you use the ideal, ideal gas constant. Okay, um, so that's the diffusion equation. That's it, it, in case you just have diffusion in your system. Uh, we normally have other things beyond just diffusion. Uh, we have reaction terms and you can add reaction terms to this equation as well, uh, where you know, this becomes sort of a master equation again, where the left-hand side is your accumulation. The right-hand side, this is like kind of like in minus out uh, of your control volume. And then you also have like, you know, consumption and reaction terms, blah, blah, blah. Uh, production, et cetera, after that. And you could have uh, also bulk flow if you want. You could add that to this uh, equation that also kind of just adds right in there, um, which we, we will rarely, if ever, consider bulk flow in this class. There's one thing that I wanted to mention that I, I, I didn't, neglected to mention last time. And uh, so it was about diffusion. And if you remember last time, we had this 
we, we had this scenario where we ended up with this, with this fixed law of diffusion. And right before we actually derived it as fixed law of diffusion, we had said this. We had said j of x equals to, and there was some stuff in the middle, but eventually at the end what it was equal to was negative of delta x quantity squared over delta t times dc dx evaluated at x. Well, we'll just get rid of that part. Okay. So, so that was fixed law, and then we said, look, this one here, this grouping, this cannot depend on delta x. Because the left-hand side didn't depend on delta x, and the second factor on the right-hand side didn't depend on delta x. So you couldn't have that factor depending on delta x. Okay, uh, and that led us to say, well, let's call this something. Let's call this the diff diffusivity. And I didn't go over, I mean, it should be clear from, like, the way that diffusivity was made up in this equation, but I didn't go over a couple things about it. One was I didn't say, hey, here are the units of diffusivity, right? It's typically, like, length squared per second, but for us in the biological realm, that's often micron squared per second. If you're talking about things that have bigger diffusivities, sometimes it's centimeters squared per second, but for us it's micron squared per second. Um, for comparison, or just to, to uh, keep in mind, the diffusivity of a typical uh, like protein in the cytoplasm of the cell is somewhere, usually bet somewhere between 1 and 25 micron squared per second. That's kind of the range. The other thing that's true about this, as you can see from, uh, th there's a reason why the diffusivity has these units. And that's because, so diffusion is basically a random walk, right? So molecules are randomly moving around and bumping into each other, and they're moving in one direction, they bump into another molecule, they move in another direction, and blah, blah, blah. So it's randomly moving around and it's spreading out over time. Um, so we can uh, start, uh, you know, we can, like mathematically, we can start with a simulation where the initial conditions are basically like really high concentration at x equals zero. And then over time, that will spread out, right? Uh, you know, you're going to get over time it'll become lower, but also more spread out. And you can solve the diffusion equation and see that this is true. As it's spreading out, you can calculate something about the distribution of your, um, of your molecule, and that would be the average displacement, the square of the average displacement away from its starting point. And since everything in this simulation started at zero, that's just uh, the average of, the, of x squared, right? And this average of x squared goes as the amount of time that has elapsed. Now, so if something, like, you know, usually what we're thinking about when we're thinking about things moving around with some speed is, like, at the macro level, if something has a velocity, like you throw a ball or a car is driving with some velocity, the amount of, the, 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 the distance that it went is going to be linear in time, right? So instead of delta x, or sorry, the average of x squared, proportional to t, it'll be x proportional to t. And the proportionality constant will be the velocity. Here, in this case, because it's diffusion, because it's a random walk, that actually um, changes the, the dependence on, on time. Another way to say that is, re remember what I said this delta t was. This delta t was the time scale for a molecule to move a distance of delta x. And I said that, that time scale has to depend on delta x, but not linearly. That's just what I said. And we've figured out that it depends on delta x as a squared fashion. Um, and so what that means is, if, I, if, if I'm asking you a question, and I say, look, we have a molecule 
that has a diffusivity of 10 microns squared per second. On average, what's the time scale over which it's going to cross one cell diameter, which is about, let's say, 7 microns, or 10 microns, to make it easier, right? So if, if d equals 10 microns squared per second, and the delta x we're talking about is like one cell diameter, which is about 10 microns, what is the time scale delta t? What is that time scale? And it's a simple calculation. So delta t equals to, let's scroll up just a little bit so you can see where this is coming from, delta t is going to be equal to delta x squared over d. It works out in terms of the units. It works out in terms of where d came from in the first place. This is bothering me, this bracket here. There we go. Okay, so if, you know, in terms of like engineering type calculations, if someone's asking you for a time scale, a diffusion time scale, and you can say, well, for, you know, crossing what distance? And you can, and they'll say, well, 10 microns. Then you do this calculation. And so this is, this will be about 10 seconds, right? So 10 microns quantity squared divided by 10 microns squared per second gives you 10 seconds. But to be more accurate, there's actually um, this, this time scale here is actually delta x quantity squared divided by 2 times the diffusivity, which would make it 5 seconds. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that correction.